Hi, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's last session, which is on surveillance, oversight and accountability. I'm Alice Ross, I'm a journalist at The Guardian, I'm going to be chairing the session this afternoon. And it's on a really fitting and exceptionally timely topic, which is um, surveillance legislation. I mean, basically the only bit parliamentary business that's happening at the moment is the IP bill, while everything else gets suspended for the European referendum. Um, so it just seems like a very well-timed session. Um, and I've got an amazing panel this afternoon. I've got David Anderson QC, who is the government's independent um, led, um, review of terror terrorism legislation, or terror watchdog, as he calls himself on Twitter. Um, last year, he published a report, A Question of Trust, which was um, reviewing the government's surveillance powers. I've also got Michael Drury, former director of legal affairs at GCHQ, the British government's communications surveillance headquarters, who was part of the team that drafted REPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. And I've also got Matthew Ryder, QC, a barrister at Matrix Chambers, who's challenged the government on its surveillance powers in numerous high-profile cases, including representing Liberty at the Investigatory Powers Tribunal and David Miranda over his detention at Heathrow for carrying Snowden material. Um, the way we're going to work this afternoon is we're going to have a presentation from David Anderson. Then I've got a couple of questions. Then we're going to hear from Michael and then from Matthew and then as many more questions as we can fit in. So, Thank you, Alice, uh, very much indeed. Modern children uh, can have more than two parents, of course, and this bill, the Investigatory Powers Bill, had at least three. Those are the three reports that were commissioned in 2013 or 2014 uh, to try and address uh, aspects of this problem. My report is the, the middle one. It was commissioned as a consequence of a political deal after the Data Retention Directive was declared invalid by the European Court of Justice in Digital Rights Ireland. The legal basis for the UK's data retention law fell away, and as its price for agreeing to the emergency legislation that was sent through Parliament to replace it, the opposition required a uh, report to be produced. Um, I think the Home Office hoped and expected it would be a very limited report. I still remember Yvette Cooper, who was a Shadow Home Secretary, taking me aside and saying, David, I hope it's a book. <laughs> and uh, those words did haunt me over the next 10 months or so. Um, the first was by the Intelligence and Security Committee. They concentrated on intelligence. They said that the police and other users of, uh, of uh, investigatory powers uh, needed no change. Um, and then the third is a multidisciplinary panel under the auspices of the Royal United Services Institute. So those were the parents. And then on the 4th of November, uh, we got a draft bill. And people were kind enough to credit my uh, report for uh, some of the things, or at least for the structure and the main lines of the bill. And indeed, uh, I was very pleased to see that they had tried at least to do the really big things that I was asking them to do. The first thing was to make transparent all these powers that nobody even really knew were being used until Mr. Snowden uh, came along and set them out honestly. Uh, the second thing was to, well, that's the second thing as well. Um, getting them to disclose all the powers um, was not the easiest. Um, I had one recommendation uh, that was not in my report, but consisted of a letter written by me to the Prime Minister saying, I really think you need to disclose this, this last one. And to his credit, um, there was no question of any uh, disagreement. Uh, they did ask for one new power, a very controversial one, uh, which I wasn't sure about because they certainly hadn't made out the case uh, for it to me. They've been trying to prove that case since. But that is the power, uh, I'll put it in non-technical terms, because partly because even technical people find it difficult to understand exactly how it will be done but it would be a power to uh, uh, require service providers to retain effectively the internet records of uh, everybody in the country. That's not every page they visit, but every site to the first slash. Uh, so that in particular, if they were uh, visiting, say, a communication site, if they were on Skype at a particular time, and you were trying to trace through the conspiracy, uh, you would then be in a position to go to Skype and say, please know we have a lot of the conversation. That was the one new power they said they wanted. As far as I know, it was unknown in the world, except in Denmark, where they had something similar for about seven years. It was repealed in 2014, because the police couldn't use it. And I think Martin will confirm they tried it in Finland, um, but they were not backed by a parliamentary committee, or so I read anyway um, in the Open Rights Group publication. And then finally, very important, if they're going to have all these powers, they needed much stronger authorization and oversight. I think that is broadly what the draft bill did. So you can imagine how I felt. The baby had been born, 
It just seemed a miracle that uh, my, I think, very ambitious report had resulted in a very ambitious bill. Uh, and nicest of all, anyone who's had a baby will know, is when people say, it looks just like you. So I uh, asked in their approval and watched the little baby as it began to grow. Uh, <laughs> you never know with babies. <laughs> yeah, you have to learn to decode their, their language and their body language. <laughs> and sometimes, quite early on, you, you wonder, well, you know, are they really as, as sweet and, and as well disposed as, as perhaps they, they, they seemed at first? And as a baby turns into a child, uh, you know, maybe you get uh, two views. And we, these are two uh, descriptions of the bill. Uh, the left-hand one is how it was described by the Home Secretary when she introduced draft bill uh, to Parliament. And in fact, everyone agrees it will be world-leading, but some people don't think that's a good thing uh, if they don't like the bill. Worse than scary is a comment made yesterday by Mr. Kanakachi, the UN uh, rapporteur on privacy, who said some very polite things about the bill, but then really let rip when he was off script uh, in, the, in the press conference. So uh, mixed uh, feelings. And then, of course, comes the inevitable uh, guilt. You know, if it turned out wrong, was it my fault? <laughs> was it something I, I did or, or something I, I didn't do? And uh, you have to go through, through that. But fortunately, of course, the responsibility is not mine alone. The draft bill was subject to scrutiny by three parliamentary committees. If you look at my uh, Dropbox uh, presentation, you'll see more details and indeed links to those reports. Um, the, the most devastating and the shortest, it was only 12 pages long, was the second one. Devastating partly because it came from Parliament's own Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, and the longest and most careful, and I think actually very impressive report, was the report of the Joint Committee, which made the great bulk of the, I think, 198 uh, recommendations. Those all came out in early February, and in the bill itself, which was uh, laid before Parliament and had its first reading last week, uh, it's correct to say, as the government has said, that the vast majority of those uh, uh, recommendations were accepted, although some of the most uh, far-reaching of them uh, were not. Well, this is really a disclaimer. Uh, I am not, uh, I have no ongoing competence in relation to surveillance. My job is reviewing the counter-terrorism laws, not reviewing the surveillance laws, and not reviewing this bill. So in a sense, I've waved goodbye to this baby. I have other babies that have arrived since I'm doing a at the moment on citizenship deprivation, I've got one coming up on deportation and insurance, that I'm looking at the Terrorism Act, that I'm looking at executive orders. So don't look to me, please, for uh, chapter and verse of every detail of this bill. But I would like to say something about uh, some of the main issues that have come up, and I'll, I'll do this in a very general way. They're not all about uh, oversight, because I'm not sure that oversight is the only important issue. The first issue is timing, uh, and there have been a lot of people, in fact, some people in this room, signed a letter to the Telegraph last week saying this is all just going too fast. And I have a lot of sympathy with that. When you look at the bill, it is huge. When the bill was lodged last week, there were about 800 pages of materials. Um, the bill itself was what to me of, and an awful lot of uh, codes of practice, explanatory notes, operational cases for some of the powers. And it's great that all those things were produced, uh, but it is going to be a test, uh, and the people who really care about these things are going to have to work very hard to stay on top of it. However, do not despair. Remember that, first of all, when Dripper was going through in 2014, uh, a lot of voices in Parliament were saying uh, it's ridiculous to allow Dr Dripper to sunset it to the end of 2016. And people were saying that's far too long. You know, how about the end of 2015? There's plenty of time to get replacement legislation in place. Well, uh, plainly, that would not have been the way to go. It would have been a terrible rush job. And what um, the government say is, well, uh, Vallis was saying not much else going on at the moment in Parliament. We're going to take our time. We've got until December. We intend to take until December if we need it. Home Secretary has said it will proceed at a normal parliamentary pace. And for those of you who don't know much about parliamentary procedure, I mean, you've got actually a baroness here who, who lives and breathes it. She sits in the House of Lords, so Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the first stage will be the second reading on the 19th of March. That will be a chance for the House of Commons to express any general concerns they may have on points of principle. But then the really important bit happens. The Joint Committee is formed, the Public Bill Committee, I understand they're already, uh, they're already selecting members, but it won't formally be launched until uh, the 19th of March, assuming that the bill passes its second reading. Um, that's who the members on the committee will be. I've singled out a couple of them, um, because leading for this on Labour will be Keir Starmer QC, leading on this for the Scottish National Party will be Joanne Cherry QC, people who know the law in this country 
uh, might find it difficult to think of two better qualified senior barristers, uh, specifically in the field of human rights. Uh, Joanna Cherry, uh, absolute beacon in Scotland in that area. Keir Starmer, you will know his books on human rights. You also may be served five years as director of public prosecutions. If they put their backs into it, and if they are uh, equipped with appropriate stance, and if people like you who have things to say are able to communicate that to them, I would urge you to do it. Um, because this committee is uh, going to really get hold of this bill. There will probably be four public evidence sessions. There might be 20 sessions to go through the bill line by line. Uh, and the scrutiny that they can give it will only be as good as the ammunition that they are provided with. Then it will go to a report stage in the House of Commons, uh, reading the House of Commons, it will go to the Lords. And it's probably going to, I would think, have a tougher time in the Lords than in the Commons. The government has a majority in the Commons, albeit a very narrow one. It certainly doesn't have a majority in the Lords. And I think you're going to find a lot of people, is it 100 Liberal Democrats in, in, the, in the... 111 Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords. There's not much to be liberal about at the moment. Well, um, this uh, will be a godsend for them. <laughs> Sorry, today we defeated government on violence against the right to work government. Right, okay, well that's good. Sarah's <laughs> reliably liberal. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does it cover? Well, it, my brief was just to look at uh, interception of communications and um, the collection and retention of communications data. Um, I wasn't asked to look at equipment interference, as it's now called, or hacking, or the implantation of malware, as other people uh, call it. Um, but I did uh, allude to it um, without actually uh, looking in detail at the, the evidence. The, the bill has been criticised not only for being too long, but also for being too short. And indeed, it's quite right that it doesn't cover other investigatory powers. So, for example, if you're going to put a, a tail on somebody in the street, if you're going to put a bug in their apartment or in their car, um, you might be seeking exactly the same result as you would be getting by, by putting a tap on their line. Why shouldn't it be subject to exactly the same uh, regime? Of course, in logic, that is absolutely right. Um, it, it is, there is a, uh, an element of drawing together in that we, when we look at oversight, you will see that there is now to be one single very powerful uh, regulator which will oversee all these powers. That hasn't been uh, the case in the past. I think that is one advantage. But certainly, as far as the law is concerned, uh, these powers, which in some ways are, are, are more intrusive, um, are not going to be subject to the same act. Another criticism actually made by the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee is why didn't we take the opportunity to reformulate the entire statutory basis for the intelligence agencies? That's what they recommended last March. That's what they do. They do the intelligence agencies. They don't do anybody else. They always saw this as an agency-focused uh, enterprise. And I think probably the answer to both those things is we're always nice to have new consolidated uh, sometimes there are practical limits that can be achieved, and of course, had either of those things been done, the timing constraints would have been even uh, greater. Then another major concern about scope is about extraterritorial effect. A lot of these powers assert wide extraterritorial effect. I rather uh, went along with that in my report. Uh, I accepted that it was definitely suboptimal, uh, and that what we really needed was uh, an agreement, preferably a multilateral agreement uh, with the US, which would enable our law enforcement, for example, uh, when it wanted to know what had been going on uh, over a US uh, ISP uh, communication system to present a warrant and have it honored in the US on a sort of reciprocal basis, it's something that's been trialed and now works very effectively with child sex and exploitation, which doesn't work across the field uh, of organized crime. And there have been some rather nice leaks in the FT suggesting that that is happening. Uh, at least uh, talks are taking place, perhaps bilateral talks in the first instance, but there is an expectation that others will join in. Uh, if that is so, and I have no privileged knowledge of it, I think that is a thoroughly good thing. My recommendation that they retain, there are no new extraterritorial powers, but my recommendation they retain the ones they have, was I'm afraid very pragmatic. I talked to US firms who said, we know you're unlikely ever to seek to enforce these warrants in the US, you might find it very difficult to try. But it makes it a hell of a lot easier for our shareholders and our customers if we can tell them uh, that we only comply uh, with the warrants that we're required to comply with by the law of the US or by the law of a friendly foreign nation. So it has at least that value and produces assistance where it is needed, and for the time being, uh, those provisions stay in the Act and the Bill. Powers, I know this isn't really about authorization, but it seems to me actually easily the most important thing about this Bill is the scope of the, of the powers. What I've set out here are, are mostly uh, bulk powers, which of course are the uh, controversial ones, albeit that uh, we're told that all but one of these, the Internet Connection Records, have already been exercised uh, in the past. Uh, and I've uh, 
divided approximately into police powers and uh, agency uh, powers. The first is the power that was uh, no longer available after Digital Rights Island. That's really the entry level power to collect phone logs, who was phoning who, when, um, uh, and uh, email similar details, and to retain those for 12 months. Uh, something which law enforcement finds extremely useful in tracing back uh, conspiracies. Uh, internet connection records I've talked about, uh, and equipment interference, the police will get so called targeted equipment interference, but not the, the bulk power. And then for the intelligence agencies, it's bulk interception, uh, bulk personal data sets, and bulk equipment interference. And bulk equipment interference is the most striking of these powers. Uh, and the Intelligence and Security Committee, under its new chair, Dominic Reeve QC, who was sacked by the Prime Minister last year and therefore owes him no particular loyalty, uh, was uh, pretty unrestrained in its, in its criticism of what the government was asking for. And you see, what they said there. You'll understand what they mean if you look at the bill and you look at the so-called targeted equipment interference power. Um, now that might sound to you or me uh, as though I just identify one particular mobile phone in the Yemen and, and I get the right warrant and it's all signed off by a judge and then I can do my magic and, and maybe see what I can get inside it. But if you look at how targeted is defined, it is so broad and it could, it could, it could, it could relate to all the devices in a location, for example, or all the devices that it might be necessary to target in pursuance of a specific investigation. And the mind would boggle them. And, and I think what the IFC must have asked GCHQ in their closed evidence session, they only heard four witnesses, um, but one was the director of GCHQ. They must have said, well, if you've got such broad thematic patterns under the targeted provision, why do you need bulk as well? And they weren't satisfied with the answer. This is the answer as I can understand it from the operational case, no doubt drafted by GCHQ and lodged uh, last uh, week. They accept uh, that the targeted warrant can be extremely broad, um, but they justify the bulk warrant in perhaps slightly curious way uh, by saying, oh, well, we need a bulk warrant as well because there are better safeguards on bulk warrants. And being very responsible people, uh, we would feel that there were situations in which it's appropriate to go for a bulk warrant so that the safeguards can be on. So it must be foreign focused um, and there must be additional access controls. If it's so called targeted, then you don't need access controls because you've already identified your target, that's the theory. If it's bulk, you do need uh, actually very rigorous access control if the, if the person you're looking at is inside the UK. So that's the way they look at it. Um, rash for me probably the same thing to publish it like that, but you can make up your own mind. I know that the Parliament will want to get its teeth into that rather difficult area. Well, I'm not sure if we're all lawyers, but I know a lot of us are, and uh, this plainly is the main uh, legal uh, uh, controversy of this bill. It's in this area of bulk. And the difficulty, I suspect, uh, will not be with the UK courts, so much as with the courts in Europe, and specifically the court of the EU in Luxembourg and the court of the uh, Council of Europe in Strasbourg. And I think it's fair to say, you know, Martin and I have discussed this, and you know, he probably has a, a view maybe a little different from mine, uh, but I think you can discern in those courts and in those institutions two basic strands of opinion when it comes to bulk. And the first one, which I just sought to illustrate by a couple of paragraphs from Digital Rights Ireland, is actually a pretty absolute uh, view uh, that bulk is so, bulk collection is so fundamental an infringement of personal privacy uh, that it's going to be pretty difficult to justify. And uh, I won't read all this out, but you see that one of the objections they had to the old data retention directive was that uh, the data it collected wasn't restricted. It wasn't aimed only at people you suspected or people who might otherwise be able to contribute to solving a crime. People, of course, you knew in advance could do those things. Um, but it, it was general, so that if you only found out six months down the line um, that somebody uh, had a contact, you could still pursue and see when they were speaking to each other. So now whether that was a fatal objection to the directive, one doesn't know. They had so many objections to it. They set them all out in a classic uh, CJEU style. And then said at the end, it must therefore be held, it sounds so much better in French, uh, with a, a sweep of the arm as a director did that. Now, some courts have simply taken the view, a lot of constitutional courts in Europe have taken the view that that's it, you can't do data retention even on a national legal basis. Two others, a court in Sweden and a court of appeal in the UK, I'm not so sure, they made a reference to the Court of Justice, and they all have an opportunity to explain what they mean. Here is Again, I've just taken a paragraph. One, one, can, one can find a lot in these cases. 
Uh, but it's an example of a slightly different approach. I think you see it in the Venice Commission uh, report on bulk that came out the spring of last year. And you also see traces of it in this uh, paragraph in quite a recent case against Hungary in Strasbourg. Uh, a very different feel to the language. It's a natural consequence of the forms taken by present-day terrorism that you have the massive monitoring of communications. Uh, and in the face of this progress, uh, the courts uh, really got to focus on safeguards. So either you take the view, bulk is just dreadful and really shouldn't happen at all, or you say, we can get used to it, but only if there's really good safeguards. So that's simplified. Um, and when I said the problems are not in the English courts, um, these are just a couple of examples of recent cases. The first one is on DNA retention. Uh, the question was, could the police indefinitely retain uh, the DNA of people they'd arrested but not charged? Um, so <laughs> this went 5 0 in favour of the, the government or the police in the UK. Actually, it was 10 0 if you include the earlier courts. Two judges in the Divisional Court, three in the Court of Appeal, five in what turned out to rules. They all said it was fine. It went to Strasbourg, they took it to the Grand Chamber, 17 0 the other way, <laughs> including the British. Um, so that was sort of emblematic. Maybe there's a different way of thinking of it. Um, Dillon, case on stop and search, actually a less dramatic example because the Court of Appeal came to the conclusion that Strasbourg eventually agreed with. But again, the, the privacy right. And this is Lord Sumption uh, uh, putting into words what a lot of people, I think, have thought um, that these continentals seem, for one reason or another, to be much more concerned about these things than we are. Well, that's what I um, dared to say in my report to the question of trust. It's not for me to advise judges. When I make submissions to them, as I often do, they're uh, usually rejected. But uh, it, it does seem to be actually something very worrying. Someone who's completely committed to the European project, I've done probably 150 cases before the Justice of the EU. I can't think of another uh, area of law in which the difference between the judicial move is so great on this side of the channel uh, and in Luxembourg. Now, I'm sure there are historical reasons for that. I think you can see very strong German, East European influence in some of these, uh, these, these, these judgments. And uh, that has not been our experience, uh, not to be smug about things, uh, but just to say uh, that to the extent you can do it within the law, maybe there has to be some recognition of the fact that different countries do different things in slightly different ways. I think the important thing for any court looking at this, or indeed any person looking at this, is to concentrate on the evidence. I think what British people find particularly difficult is any suggestion that there's a sort of per se rule uh, that infringements of a particular kind must be wrong and can never be justified. Because there is actually a lot of evidence on this. Mr. Kelly Catcher said yesterday he'd never seen any. Uh, but there is a lot, um, a lot of evidence on the utility of bulk. There's the, uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which has had a number of cases on it, the Interception Commissioner, uh, who reviews the secret material and reports on it twice a year, the Intelligence Services Commissioner, and actually Annex 9 to my report where I managed with great difficulty to screw six examples out of GCHQ for how uh, bulk collection had helped to catch terrorists in one case, uh, child abusers. And I had the opportunity to sit there and cross-examine them. I looked at the contemporaneous intelligence reports. I spoke to the desk officers who'd been there at the time. And I satisfied myself uh, that uh, they were worth putting in. Does that mean that it must therefore be proportionate and lawful? No, of course not. Uh, but to me, uh, to argue that uh, these powers are useless and that uh, all these agencies have been wasting their time and their money for all these years by exercising them uh, is really a very long way from uh, reality. And then I think the really positive development, um, and I don't know who persuaded GCHQ to do this, but with the bill last week was lodged an operational case, that's 47 pages, some of it is padding, uh, but they have at least attempted to set out uh, how it is that they use these powers and why it is uh, operationally effective for them to do so. And I hope people will really crawl over that. In fact, I see from Twitter they're doing that already. I hope people pick holes uh, in it. I hope GCHQ are called to account and, and forced to justify what they're saying. But I think it's absolutely where we should be. Uh, for the first time, really, it's possible to have a public debate on how useful these powers can be. And it's only when you know about that uh, that you can really come to any judgments, it seems to me, about whether the infringement of privacy is worthwhile. And then how big is the infringement of privacy? Well, I think the challenge is now really for the privacy advocates uh, to explain why it is so bad. I and mean, I can understand entirely the legal argument that your privacy is at least notionally infringed from the very moment uh, that your communications are intercepted by a machine, even before someone has applied a selector to them and in the last resort even, even read them. Uh, but it seems to me that what they need on the privacy side of the argument is a case that really makes you sit up. Uh, we know from uh, 
chips, police chips, undercover police officers. It's a horrendous story. Police officer who infiltrated an environmental protest group uh, and ended up fathering a child by one of the, the protesters. And now anyone who hears that is going to say, well, that's an abuse of power. Where is the equivalent of abuse? Where are the people whose, whose lives have been ruined by bulk uh, collection? I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I'm saying I don't think that case has been made as yet. Fascinating coincidence of politics and law, because as this bill is going through, both European courts are getting ready with some really important judgments. Uh, Davis Watson, two MPs, one Conservative, one Labour, they have challenged the domestic data retention, so the plain vanilla, the phone logs and so on. Um, they went to the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal didn't know what digital rights island was meant. Uh, Court of Appeal thinks that uh, Luxembourg went further than Strasbourg, so they have asked Luxembourg what it was on about. And Luxembourg has responded by listing that case urgently for the 12th of April. So we'll have a hearing very soon, almost within a month. Uh, we'll have judgment, I'm sure, before the bill has finished its passage through Parliament, because I imagine that was one of the reasons for expediting it. And indeed, the, the court said as much in its, uh, in its order of expedition. So that will be really interesting. I suspect uh, we'll, hit, we'll have the judgment after the referendum, uh, <laughs> if, if the Court of Justice uh, knows what is good for it. Um, then in Strasbourg, we have two big challenges to bulk collection. Uh, big Brother Watch has been there a long time. Liberty joined it last year. I don't know. Others may know when they're likely to be decided. OK. Authorization, next big issue, we've talked about powers, and I'll, I'll go quickly through this. Um, the controversial issues, first of all, is the dual lock. Um, they didn't go as far as I did with authorization. I said, just leave it to the judges. There might be a category of cases involving foreign policy, you know, if you're going to tap the phone of a foreign leader or something, where it wasn't fair to leave the judge with the question of whether that was necessary, in which case the Secretary of State could certify that it was, and the judge would, would, would again say that only on judicial review grounds. Court, uh, the government didn't buy that. Um, they did buy the principle that no warrant should enter into force without having been approved by a judge. And I was very pleased about that. But probably because uh, ministers uh, do very much uh, value the work they do signing warrants, uh, uh, ministers are going to carry on not signing the warrants that they already signed. It's just that having done so, they will then go to a judge, rather as is the case, for example, in Canada, although um, I believe on a much smaller scale. To my mind, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny way of doing it, um, to put it lightly, because the Home Secretary signs almost 2,500 of these warrants uh, a year. I once got into terrible trouble with her by saying that, I, that she signed these warrants effectively in her spare time, and she put me right on that in no uncertain terms. She sets time aside every morning and every afternoon to sign warrants. Of course, the great majority of them are police warrants, which in every sensible country I know of go straight from the police to the judge. And I really don't understand uh, why this isn't the case under this bill. Maybe it's one of those issues that if people push the resistance will uh, crumble. Um, but in terms of what judges do, um, they have a judicial review function. They review the decision the minister has made. Um, but the Home Secretary has said some very helpful things about the way that function is to be exercised. It's for the judges to decide how strict their scrutiny will be. I don't believe the judges will act as rubber stamps. I think it would be very foolish if they did. Uh, and I think they need to uh, assert themselves, and as the statute asks them to do, actually look at whether the warrant is necessary, look at whether it's proportionate, and not be too free with the deference uh, to the executive discretion. Um, I also hope, and here we're in sort of USA Freedom Act uh, territory, um, and I believe that uh, this is going to be possible, that the judges uh, are going to need independent lawyers to act in appropriate cases as an amicus. Uh, and uh, I've certainly had assurances about that. There are assurances in the code of practice that the money will be there for independent lawyers for that purpose. And also they have to publish uh, some of their decisions and opinions. They probably can't publish the whole thing, but it seems to me that the FISA court started gaining in respect when it started publishing redacted opinions. And it's necessary to do that, to show the public that these guys are really doing a job of work and not just sitting in an office with a rubber stamp. Another issue I'm concerned about thematic warrants. You've got targeted bulk distinction, uh, but tagged on to targeted are thematic warrants. I didn't have a problem with that. I could see value in having a warrant for a particular criminal gang, for example, and then as new people come into the gang, you could extend the warrant, you could modify it to include them. It seems to me uh, that if you would have needed uh, a warrant signed off by a judge for that individual, then you should also need a warrant signed off by a judge to join that individual to the gang. A lot of other people said the same thing, not in the bill yet. Uh, let's hope that happens. Then on the communications data side, and this is probably where they did least to uh, give effect to my concerns. Um, the bill is better than the draft bill in that there are there are better provisions written into it for journalists and lawyers sensitive uh, 
communications. Uh, but internet connection records, these extremely controversial uh, uh, categories of data, so far known only in Denmark, uh, will be effectively self-authorized by the police if the bill stays in its current form, albeit not by people on the operational team, and will be with the intervention of a single point of contact, which uh, gives an element of functional independence. Uh, and I wonder whether that's really uh, tenable. There's also recently come in a suggestion, uh, at least a nod towards my idea that at least any uh, application of comms data that is novel or contentious uh, should go to the judicial commissions for uh, sign off. It's always said that they can't all go to judges. Um, if you're fighting malware, for example, um, cyber warfare, GCHQ uh, might need to access five or 10,000 times a day uh, communications data. And it's thought that a judge, whether it be winked or otherwise, is probably not the easiest way uh, to do that. But we do know from Digital Rights Island, or we appear to know, that some kind of prior independent authorization is required when you're accessing communications data. And if that is repeated in the judgment, and I suspect we're going to see this summer, I think we're going to need some change in that regard. I can kind of understand why the government are dragging their feet. They, they, are, they have their own interpretation of Digital Rights Island, which the Court of Appeal thought was sufficiently arguable to send to Luxembourg. Uh, but it may be that Plan B is going to be needed uh, not very far down the line. And then finally, we've got review. Uh, we've got the Investigative Powers Commission, which is this large amalgamated group of commissioners uh, chaired by a senior judge. I think it will be a senior serving judge, um, and with other judges uh, available for voluntary, but also a large number of technical inspectors um, with now a specific statutory right to get inside all the systems of the people they monitor. The Interception Commissioner is really the model here. It's an exceptionally good, uh, <coughs> exceptionally good judge-led reviewer currently operates across the intelligence police and everybody else. Uh, but the idea is to, to, to magnify that, make it more powerful. There's investigative powers tribunal, not a lot of change there. That's the case where all the Snowden allegations have been raised, and in some cases the government has been told uh, that it's been acting unlawfully, although uh, generally speaking because it hasn't sufficiently explained on the face of statute what it's doing rather than because what it's doing is actually proportionate. Uh, error reporting, uh, there isn't an absolute obligation to tell everyone when they've been intercepted, uh, but there is, in the new bill last week, now a power for the, uh, the, the commissioner on review to inform somebody directly who they think has been wrongly intercepted, so that they have an opportunity to seek a remedy before the tribunal. Intelligence sharing, another very controversial issue. There's a provision in the bill suggesting that intelligence should only be shared with other countries uh, if they have equivalent safeguards to those that have been in place for minimization, retention periods, and so on in the UK. No doubt there'll be a debate about that as well. So uh, I end on the slightly sententious uh, note, uh, which I sounded in my report, which I actually called the question of trust, because I think that's actually what it's uh, all about. I think one of the rather intriguing or troubling uh, problems about this bill, depending on how you look at it, is that in this interconnected world, uh, it's not going to be enough to get the trust of the British Parliament or the British people. Uh, at the end of the day, you're also going to need the trust of internet companies in San Francisco, and you're going to need the trust of judges in the European courts, at least for as part as, as long as we are part of that uh, European uh, system. And I think the next nine months are going to be extraordinarily important uh, in ensuring uh, that we reach that happy position. Thank you very much. Should we just take three really quick questions? If you could identify yourself um, and keep the questions as brief as you can so that we can get on to Michael and Matthew's presentations, that would be great. Um, so, um, Federica, I believe, and then Stephen. Stephen. Okay, so I'm Federico Fabrini, and I'm Associate Professor of, of European Law at the University of Copenhagen. I just want to have, ask a question that was interesting. Alice said the only two things that are debated now is the referendum and this bill, but I'm wondering to what extent really they are linked. There's one provision I was tr trying to check it on my iPad when we start uh, uh, playing now, uh, the settlement between the UK and, and, and the EU um, reached out to the European Council two weeks ago, where I think the European Council re reaffirms Article 4.2 of the Treaty on the European Union, where in theory national security is exclusively the competence of the member state. Now, as an EU lawyer, I think that provision has no meaning whatsoever because the European Court of Justice has always said, at least since CRT in 1991, that whatever the member states are derogating from EU law, they are still subject to EU law. And of course, um, the Digital, Digital Rights Ireland 
uh, declare the, uh, illegal the data retention directive, but of course that means that we still apply the data protection directive uh, and all the retention measures are exception to the data retention directive, so they fall certainly under new law, and my reading of, of Digital Rights Ireland is that the standard is quite strict, so there's probably nothing uh, the UK government can say in Glastonbury to convince the judges, so that, okay. I'd be happy to have your view of this. Thanks. Lovely. And is there a second question? Is there? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was very, very informative, and, and I can see it's only the tip of the iceberg because there's so many other things going on. But, so it's a couple of quick, somewhat related questions. Uh, it seems to be that a lot of the uh, objection, a lot of the answer to complaints about bulk collection as well, uh, they can do thematic warrants anyway. It sounded from your presentation that they've taken it as a premise that thematic warrants are okay, but thematic warrants can be uh, you know, all, all every area code in London that would be that would not be considered as I understand it the intelligence community does not consider that to be bulk collection or every area code in Edinburgh that would be a thematic warrant so in the, in the USA in the Freedom Act they've, ex they've narrowed the definition of what can count so it can't just be a geographical area um, so that it seems to me that the debate between thematic warrants and bulk really depends a lot on, on whether thematic are really just another name for essentially bulk. Is there so question number? Is there any effort to cabin what that means? What thematic counts? Secondly, uh, you mentioned about abuses of bulk collection, and I, it seems to me that a lot of that depends on what limits there are on mining the bulk that they have, and that's where it seems there ought to be. If you're going to allow bulk collection, there has to be some threshold like a court or a judge that says, when can you go into the bulk that you have to search? And um, I wonder if you could elaborate, for example, on that, if, whether there is any issue there. And if so, how does it work with special protections for journalists, politicians? Because where bulk collection can be disastrous is in terms of an issue we talked about this morning, which is investigative reporting and whistleblowers and the ability of this kind of data to slam the door on any whistleblowing possibility. Um, so, um, David. Wow, uh, this is quite a gathering, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Those are incredible questions. Um, yeah, and the government is very attached to the national security exception. I only know one case on it, and it was that, uh, was it ZZ? There must be someone here who knows, and I think the Italian government didn't have very good luck in their argument, but it was, uh, it was, it was meaningful. Um, but as you say, David Cameron tried to buttress it further in the negotiations he had with the council. Um, it's hard for me to say, really. I, mean, I, I don't want to be on record as, as, as predicting what the, what the court is going to say. Will it, will it give it uh, uh, some meaning or not? And certainly, it's an important part of the, the government's position on these matters that it applies. But of course, it only works in Luxembourg. It doesn't work in Strasbourg. And Strasbourg has often looked at the, or several times looked at the collection activity of intelligence agencies, including the bulk collection activity in the Vela case. So it's not going to get them out of that particular jail. Though I sense. Uh, Dominic Grieve, who I mentioned as chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, also the Attorney General in this country for five years, gave evidence, I think, last month to the Justice Committee of Parliament. He was asked how he would compare the two courts. And he said, well, I would say the Strasbourg Court was benign and the European Court of Justice was predatory. Uh, uh, they were interesting words to choose, I thought. Um, but that's an indication, perhaps, of where they perceived the threat as, as lying. On thematic, you're, you're absolutely right. I and mean, I sense there may be an element of belt and braces here. You know, if we lose bulk, let's look, let's define thematic in a in a very broad way. But as as was frankly admitted in that operational case, it's not actually a point I saw being made very often in the pre-legislative scrutiny. But it's a very important uh, point. Uh, there would be dangers in doing that as well, because with thematic collection, certainly people in this country are less protected. With you, you have certain protections with bulk. First of all, there has to be an operational purpose before you can get your warrant and the judge has to be persuaded that it's necessary to portion for that operational purpose. But also, if you then turn up something in bulk uh, that relates to the communications of somebody within the United Kingdom, it doesn't matter whether they're a citizen or not, because we don't have citizenship uh, as the basis of our law in this area, you need to get a full-blown individual warrant to look at that person's communications, which going on in the second part of your question means that if it's a journalist or a lawyer, you've got to go through the full judicial process of demonstrating that these very exceptional uh, steps might be, might, might be needed. Which is why GCHQ are saying, well, you know, don't just leave us with thematic because we want to protect you more. Uh, let us have both as well. I think that let's just say that probably the other ways of, of cutting that particular cake. Uh, 
and, and I'm not sure that we, we've yet seen the, uh, the, the, the final uh, result. Uh, I can't now read my writing. I think, was there another question about, about the dog? Well, why don't we return to that? Yes. Uh, from uh, right. Michael Mackey. Um, so when we were discussing this before, um, before the presentation, Michael said, I'm here to defend the status quo, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you. Um, uh, I don't need any luck because the IPT is on my side. Um, <laughs> Um, well, good afternoon, and uh, you have just been treated to a tour de force, uh, which I find it absolutely impossible to follow. So, um, uh, on one on one uh, level, I'm very um, uh, happy for you. On one level, I'm very sad for me. But let me pick up a few points, really. Um, yesterday, Lord Neuberg at the um, uh, the um, uh, Supreme Head of the Supreme Court gave a gave a lecture about um, legal profession privilege, and uh, probably the thing which is. Um, uh, in legal circles, apart from this bill, which is the most interesting presently, is the current topic is legal professional privilege. And he was giving a lecture about that. And he had to do it in 20 minutes. I'm not going to be 20 minutes, I can tell you. But what he said was he, dec he decried the fact that there's so much information in written pleadings now um, uh, and uh, every, every case involved too much data. So he concluded his opening remarks with it should remind us that if it's not necessary to say something, then it's necessary not to say it. I shall be applying that um, uh, approach um, over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, Did you learn that at GCHQ? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say some things about that. Um, genuinely, well, just, I want to pick up a couple of words what David said. The first thing about Article 4.2. Um, having been involved in the drafting of Article 4.2, and I have a slightly, um, uh, slightly strange memory of that, but that's a story right, perhaps over dinner, um, um, I, I very much agree. You know, it's always been there as something of a fig leaf. How transparent the fig leaf really is, is only to be determined um, uh, by um, uh, the European Court of Justice in, in some sense. And if I were an, a, an outer in the modern parlance, it is certainly something which I will be saying probably isn't going to survive the uh, test of DCJ and would indeed be um, uh, one of those areas where you can say, this is a light motif of the approach of European um, uh, the European Court to um, uh, the British um, uh, uh, right to protect its own national security, if you're in that neck of the woods. And what I would say is, and I'm very grateful that um, uh, uh, David confirmed um, that um, uh, digital rights Ireland is completely impenetrable, as I would say it shrems, and uh, I think the Court of Appeal thinks they're pretty impenetrable, or certainly digital rights Ireland is pretty impenetrable as well. I'm, great, I'm glad that I'm not the only person who finds it difficult to follow. What I would say is interesting about that is, in fact, and you may derive something from this, is how little reliance, in the context of those proceedings domestically, um, uh, the government in its argumentation put on Article 4.2 and the limitations of European law. So I think, um, uh, again, that may tell you something about how the government thinks that um, uh, that, that operates. Let me say a couple of things about the bill before I um, uh, move on. And I think it's this, I think the bill is a hard position. Um, uh, is a highly political uh, uh, animal. It seeks to do uh, everything. Of course, it doesn't do everything. Notably, part three of the present RIPA, which is about encryption, and if this bill and the debate in public has been about anything, it has been about encryption, frankly, is not touched upon in this bill. Part three of RIPA is going to remain in force, unamended, dealing with the circumstances in which the government can seek access to encrypted material. Now, you might find that surprising, um, and you should see the debates about the bill and the, encry and the encryption um, in that context. And certainly you could argue that one of the concerns um, uh, expressed during the draft bill, which was being considered by the uh, Joint Committee and the other committees, and indeed pointed out by them, was the lack of clarity about the encryption provisions. Because what the bill sought to do in its first iteration was continue a principle which was always involved in RIPA, which was essentially that a telecommunications provider had a responsibility in law where it could do so to produce the communications to the state when it requested them in clear. Now, that has been continued through this bill. There was, unsurprisingly perhaps, in a world which 16 years on from Ripper in 2000 is a very different world, and the debate about encryption and the understanding of the benefits of encryption and its ubiquitous nature are of a completely different order, there was a lot of concern about that. One of the changes to the bill has, it has been said, to make those provisions clearer. Now, if I were a, a, a tech company, 
Um, that will be something I will be um, uh, speaking to Keir Starmer uh, and to Cherry about to ensure that those provisions are absolutely stuck with during the course of the bill. So that's, um, so that's I think, a, a particular part of that bill which has created, um, uh, which has created some degree of controversy, but where, in reality, the government appears to have um, responded um, uh, to criticisms. And again, part of the debate, um, uh, and part of the issue which I have been um, uh, dealing with for the uh, nigh on 20 years I've been dealing with these issues, first in government, now outside government, advising companies and individuals, has been the debate tends not to be, and this is one of the great advantages of David's work, tends, tends not to be a rational objective debate, it tends to take place at an emotive level. So let's look at what Edward Snowden said about the bill, shall we, in the last few days. It would be like to have a Snowden quote, it wouldn't be proper without him. <laughs> so Edward Snowden tweeted, by my read, well, can I just say, he, quote, he, he, he tweeted that pretty soon after it was published, so he tweeted very quickly, um, at Smoother's Charter. The drama of the power bill legitimizes mass surveillance. It is the most intrusive and least accountable surveillance regime in the West. So now, you know, that's kind of, um, that's kind of hyperbolic, I would suggest, whether you agree with it or not. Um, and then we have um, also a journalist, Ted Brook, I think, a colleague of Alex, in that respect, or had been past. I went one step further. Writing to the Guardian, she said, the spies have gone further than George Orwell could have imagined, created in secret and without democratic authorization, to build before Parliament, um, uh, the ultimate panopticon. Now they hope the British public will, public will make it legitimate. I mean, you can criticize the things. The only point to me saying that is that what these powers call for, what the bill calls for, is exactly what David has been saying, which is a very clear forensic analysis of are the powers justified, and I certainly I agree with him, that the, um, uh, the production of a case to demonstrate and justify um, uh, the powers that are sought is absolutely fundamental. Are they justified? Are they working proportionately? And I think the answer to the question, frankly, about um, whether or not every single postcode in London would be put on the Mac Warren is that neither the Home Secretary nor indeed the Judicial Commission of the New World would for a moment consider that to be a proportionate um, act. So I think, you know, the same thing comes back to the point David is making, which is to ensure you have the capacity, capacity to do what you need to do, you need necessarily a, a set of four powers. What you then need is a very strong, enhanced in this bill from the present regime, a very strong set of overs oversight mechanisms where the oversight mechanisms, to the extent they can be, are made public so people can test whether or not they are um, uh, taking, um, uh, taking the right approach to necessity of proportionality. Again, get back to the Pfizer, uh, to the Pfizer um, uh, example, whereby a lot more um, uh, um, democratic um, accountability comes from the fact they're publishing their um, uh, publishing their um, judgments. So, really, the only point I want to leave you with, I think, is that when you're thinking about these issues, it's important to um, uh, rely upon the facts and important to rely upon the law. Because the sense you have, the sense that some people will give in the present debate is that the present law is completely bust. It doesn't work, there's no accountability, it's obscure. Well, I would sort of, um, uh, I would take issue with each of those. In particular, I would take issue with the fact that there is really accountability. Um, and go back to the Snowden quote. Because I think what you've got presently is you do have a very strong, um, uh, a very strong court in the form of the Investigative Powers Tribunal. Matthew, um, uh, Matthew Pierce, lots of the Investigative Powers Tribunal knows far better than I do. But a very strong court which is there to test the limits of the present law. And as David said, and as founding a government, not interestingly in relation to the acts that are, that are taking place. And you can, you can say, I think, with some degree of clarity that the capacity or the um, evidence of abuse is quite limited, but actually about the way the law is structured. The Investigative Power Tribunal has developed, I would suggest, in the last 15 years, its own personality and, its, and um, uh, its own way of working, which has put lot, a lot more information out there, irrespective of Edward Snowden, 
the respective women in this happened in 2013. So I think you can see that there are checks and balances in the present system. I tend to agree with what David was suggesting, but didn't say express, which is um, uh, a rush to judgment on this bill in the light of Luxembourg's jurisprudence, in the light of um, uh, Strasbourg cases going on, and in the light of continuing cases being brought um, uh, before the IPT. There's another large IPT case due to be heard in July about um, uh, bulk data, um, uh, is, um, uh, I think, a rather foolish step. And um, although there may well be 20 sessions in committee, I do wonder whether or not the committee process is enough. And I think the other thing we should know, we should, you should look at, is you should look out for the attempts by government to um, uh, deal with issues which are perhaps not as um, uh, important as the true powers under the bill. Uh, let, let me say what I mean by that. Um, interestingly, between the very short period which the committees were um, reporting and the bill being introduced in the Parliament last week, the thing which was trumpeted um, uh, in relation to um, the discussion and the major change to focus on were changes um, concerning legal question privilege that being dragged onto the face of the bill and also to journalists. Now, those are not very, very important issues, do not get me wrong. And But clearly, you may think cynically, um, uh, those issues were trumpeted as a, um, as a means of satisfying um, the wants of lawyers and the journalists, because it's lawyers and journalists who are the ones who make the point about these things. That would be a rather cynical view. But what I would urge you to do, and I very much agree with David, I think um, uh, it's actually been coming on people um, of, um, in academia, in the legal world, and who have interest in privacy to make their views clear to the, in the context of the ongoing parliamentary debates. But I would urge you not to look at the headlines, I would urge you to look below the headline, but actually what the bill says on the face of the floor is, and how it's going to operate. Because ultimately, that's what's going to protect the privacy of the people of this country and other cities as well. Thank you. Um, hi, well, I've, I've been asked to speak today about oversight. Normally, when I'm talking about uh, the draft bill and the bill, I'm speaking about the actual powers, but today I've been asked to speak about oversight. Um, and uh, so I'll run through a little bit about how the oversight arrangements within the bill have moved from what we have currently through to what was proposed and through to what's now being debated. Um, before I do that, um, one of the things that I should mention is that I'll I will touch on the IPT, and, and before I forget, um, I'll just take up one, one thing that Michael mentioned, which is about the IPT being a very strong court. The IPT has become a stronger court, um, but where I take some disagreement, I think, is that it, it actually has become a stronger court only since 2013 and since Snowden. In the first uh, 11 or 10 years of the IPT, it made nine findings in favour of applicants, five of which were in the same case, none of which were national security cases. And um, the court sat largely in secret. It gave its judgments largely in secret. It had no, there was no real public awareness of their um, hearings or what was being debated. And national security cases were almost unheard of in the IPT. They were very, very difficult. And there was a flurry of, there was a handful of cases that had been brought, but they were unusual. And the IPT was largely dealing with part two of Reaper, ordinary police surveillance where somebody was saying, I was surveilled when about whether I'm taking my kid to the right school or whether my dog is fouling up the pavement and I think this is disproportionate. And the IPT were dealing with, with that sort of thing. And when I first started doing cases in the IPT, uh, it still felt very much like a sort of ad hoc court. Um, it had no place where it sat regularly. It had no way of communicating with it other than through a PO box. The first hearing that I went to, I was told, just wait in the Rolls Building lobby and someone will come and meet you. And I said, this was for a hearing. And I said, what will they look like? And they said, don't worry, they'll find you. 
And so when the clerk of the court found me, they took me to a room. And I'd initially looked for the room because I was told it was a particular court. There was no room existed in the Rolls building of the room that had been described to me. So I went back down to the lobby. And I was eventually taken into a sort of side room where the judge was, who offered me a cup of tea and began talking with the opponent about the case. It wasn't a national security case, and, and um, I'm not going to talk about what happened in there, but it, it still very much had the feel of a court that wasn't really used to dealing with the, the grave business of kind of constitutional human rights cases. It was dealing with smaller cases. And it has a function of investigating whether what's going on and what's happening as much as it has on ruling of issues. So there's no criticism of the judges involved. That's the remit they were given. But it, it, it's only since 2013 when we've had a string of big cases, big judgments, very much in the public eye, that we're now seeing this court, and probably to the, to the enjoyment of the judges, being able to stretch their legs, being able to really get to grips with some of the more important cases. And where I do take issue is that is entirely through the Edward Snowden revelations. It would not have happened without them, and we wouldn't be here, and the IBT wouldn't have the maturity and the kind of strength it has. So there is a danger, and, and Michael's by no means the, the only person to, to make this point. It's been made by committee members and various other people. There is a danger in thinking, as you look at it now, wow, the IBT's really got some bite, whereas You've got to remember how that's come about, and in, in my view, that's come about really because Snowden revelations took cases of the IPT to a different level. I can tell you a bit of an inside story here about that. The IPT is a first-tier court that has no right of appeal from it, and uh, many lawyers were very nervous about taking cases in the IPT and racked their brains to see if there was a way of not taking cases to the IPT. So find a way, for example, to see if you could judicially, judicially review something, or not take a Human Rights Act point, because you, you're, you're required by REAP to go to the IPT. See if there's another way you can get to an ordinary court, rather than into the IPT. And when I was asked to advise in relation to the first to Snowden cases, for Liberty and others, um, we went to the IPT because our view was, that's the court we're supposed to go to. That's where we're going to go. And we also found it quite difficult to find other ways to go. But, but <laughs> apart from that, that's where we went. And as a result, um, I do think we got a very detailed hearing in front of a very uh, large panel. It was an open hearing, an open court. All these issues were ventilated. And it really started to feel like real court proceedings in front of the high court judge. And I think that's a good thing. OK. So that was my little... I'll come back to that, I'll come back to that in, in due course. Sure, that was my little uh, side diversion. Okay, so I'll be much quicker then, really, in relation to oversight, because I know we don't have long. Uh, David, in his report, proposed, proposed a number of uh, uh, ways that oversight could be strengthened. One, a new body, uh, merging the other three bodies. Two, uh, should, uh, this new body should take over all of the oversight and auditing functions. Three, judicial commissioners, as, as he's indicated, who would authorise, the, the lawyers in the room, there's a difference between authorising and approving. Authorising is you doing the job, approving is you seeing how well somebody else did the job. So authorising was David's suggestion. Um, the ability to notify subjects uh, in relation to um, the various powers and various things that have gone wrong. Uh, fifth, not really a legal point, but an important point nonetheless. David was very keen to emphasize it should be public facing, that the, the um, new body should be public facing, transparent, and accessible. And if anybody has set the model and raised the bar on a public figure with oversight being public facing, transparent, and accessible, it is David Anderson, TC. And then uh, the IPT's uh, jurisdiction should be expanded to enable uh, declarations of incompatibility, which is what we have sought and rulings uh, subject, should be subject to appeal on points of law, so that the IPT shouldn't be the only tier uh, in which these issues can be heard. Okay, so what happened? The IP bill was published, new single body? Yes, there's gonna be one body. Take over intelligence, oversight, and auditing functions? Pretty much, most of that's going to happen in that way. There's still some that have been 
uh, left to one side. The Intelligence Service and Security Committee aren't happy about it. Some aspects of exchange of material um, uh, has been uh, remained in a different legal uh, category than, than others, but largely that's what's happened. Um, serving or retired senior judges as David proposed, yes, that's going to happen. With ability to issue guidance rather than just give rulings, yes, that should be happening too. Power to notify subjects if there's been surveillance, yes, with some qualifications, but largely that's going to happen. Public facing, transparent and accessible, that's the aspiration. It's in the bill as being something that everyone uh, is going to require them to aspire to at least. Declaration of incompatibility, no. Right of appeal, yes. So, this David Anderson, has David Anderson's suggestions been adopted in the bill? Pretty much, uh, with a few minor tweaks and a few little bits left out, pretty much, yes. Judicial authorization, though, remained a key concern, because David had proposed authorization, a judge does it, and what you've got is uh, spun as a double lock, um, by the government as if two people are doing such a great job that you've got to unlock it twice. Actually, it's a single lock which somebody else is just going to see if the lock still works. So uh, the reality is judicial authorization spun in, in a particular way, but actually David's test hadn't been adopted. Now in this area, and I'm catching the time here, in this area there are, there's one golden rule you have to remember. Um, there are two people who you don't go into a court and say you disagree with if you want the court to find your faith. And they're both called David. One is David Anderson QC, and one is David Hankins. And both of them uh, have commented publicly on judicial authorization. And David has indicated his view, and uh, confirmed it tonight, judicial authorization he has recommended. Um, David Panic QC wrote an interesting article about judicial authorization, really saying, well, don't worry, judges will be very rigorous because human rights issues are engaged and they have to be very rigorous. So judicial approval, a judge approving the Home Secretary's authorization, will boil down to being very similar to judicial authorization because the judge will have to apply a very rigorous test of what the Home Secretary has done because human rights have been engaged. Now, I don't have time to go through why there's a difficulty with that, but if you go through the IP Bill Committee report, you should look at the evidence of Martin Chamberlain, can you see, who is a a barrister who has advised the IPT in hearings, and he explains why, in his evidence, he still has concerns about it. And to put it in a nutshell, one of his principal concerns is that there are two conflicting problems when you have judicial review of the Home Secretary on an issue of national security. The conflicting problems are there are important rights engaged, which means the judge should roll up the sleeves and get stuck in. But against that, it's national security, which means the judge should back off and accept the deference of the Home Secretary's judgment. Various judges have different views about how to approach that. Some like to roll up their sleeves, but most <coughs> tend to be able to back off a bit. And how that will happen uh, is really something yet to be determined. And most of us feel it would be far better to give the judge full, uh, uh, full decision on this and um, obviously giving deference to the Home Secretary's view in making up the judge's own mind. Um, I think re realistically, um, I'm gonna have to go really sort of straight to the end because it's very tight for time. But um, I think if I was to uh, indicate what my concerns are, first, first of all, in relation to, to that issue, judicial authorization, um, there is that problem, but I do think they are different and I, and I think Judicial authorization would be preferable. Secondly, I very much agree with David, and I've given evidence before the committee about this, that conflating uh, authorization in relation to police activity and authorization in relation to uh, national security uh, is a mistake. There is no reason at all why police uh, authorization should not be by a judge. Uh, and, and national security, if it is to be by, with, with the Home Secretary and the judge approving it, should have some adversarial element just as we have in, in SIAC in relation to control rules, particularly because they come to our team ends now. There should be some element in an adversarial process if you're going to have national security assessed by the Home Secretary and judicially reviewed by judicial commissioners. Um, second, I think the function of the IPT concerns me because um, you've effectively got uh, a court which is having to deal with extremely difficult issues. And they are not expert judges in the sense of being expert in 
technical surveillance issues, and so they have to give a significant amount of deference to those who come before them, saying this is important and this is what's necessary. And for that reason, I think it, it, it is critical that if the IPT is to remain a credible court in which um, it can assess these issues, it must develop a, an element of expertise and have very, very good assistance to draw on, uh, technical assistance, in order to be able to make its decisions from the point of view of an informed basis. Lawyers can have expertise in some areas, but I can tell you from experience, this is an area where if you don't have technical advisors, computer scientists <coughs> sitting alongside you, you will go wrong. As a lawyer, you can't intuitively work out whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. The technical people have to help you. And um, finally, with that in mind, the other thing I would mention would be in relation to a, a lack of oversight on some of the elements of the bill, including, for example, the equipment interference. The equipment interference and bulk equipment interference in particular is a very, very uh, significant development in terms of how it would be used and what it could be used for. It, it can it include planting malware on computers or many, many computers or computers on an entire network. It can include accessing people's computers, computers and finding ways to put operating systems in so that your, your cameras can be activated or microphones can be activated without you knowing, without the computer revealing that to you. And these are really serious steps that can be taken and they may be powers that the police and the, and the, and the agency should have. But the difficulty with them is that once you start creating those kind of uh, uh, apps or, or malware in that way and put it out in the wild, what will transpire is a, is a question you as a judge or you as a lawyer aren't going to know about. And that is why it's critical in my view that before you are, are in a position as a judge to be authorising, forget the IPT for a minute, when you're in a position of a judge to be authorising something like a criminal interference warrant, there needs to be technical advisors who can give a proper risk assessment as to what are the consequences of putting something like this particular malware into the wild. And, or are you able to restrain it in a way that it won't go into the wild? So for, for those sorts of reasons, there needs to be much better technical assistance for those that are involved in that. There was one other thing um, I was just going to mention uh, that I think is quite important. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave it there. I got the sense that Michael was itching to respond. No, I, 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 and, and again, so just a number, a number of very quick ones, because your questions are important. The first is, the first is you know, I think 2004, there was a case called British Irish Rights Watch before the tribunal. British Irish Rights Watch was a fundamental challenge to the bulk access regime. The first challenge to the bulk access regime. It is certainly true that it did not cause. A, um, uh, the same effect as um, Snowden caused, but it was a challenge in which um, evidence was prepared, evidence was given, evidence was supplied to the other side. So all I'd say to you is um, uh, the recent, as it were, reaction to Snowden um, is, I would suggest, to be judged on the basis of whether or not um, uh, those who uh, uh, sit in civil society and uh, who felt their job was to challenge government really did an effective job before 2013 would be my slightly caustic, I'm afraid, comment on that. But it is wrong to suggest that these cases were not before the tribunal as long ago as 2004. Can, can I say something on that? I'm so sorry, but in, in relation to <laughs> that particular case, which became liberty in the UK in Strasbourg, um, which overturned the, the IPT. The difficulty no, that's all right. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. The, the, the difficulty with that case is that when it was being argued that bulk surveillance could take place, um, I can tell you from experience that there was a level of incredulity that that would actually be happening and that a, 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 a necessary and proportionate step would be to take to, to conduct that kind of bulk surveillance. And it was argued on a theoretical basis, but it was nevertheless considered to be a slightly wild and, and unsubstantiated theory as to how broad the powers could be, with the reassurance that no one would act with that level of um, excess in terms of how they would carry out surveillance. What Snowden did is turn, is, it's on the face of the app, but what Snowden did is turn what could have been a power that was, that was argued on a hypothetical basis 
into something that became a reality. And the, the transformation of a theoretical argument into something that was, then went into the IPT with fire because it, it looked like it had been substantiated was, in my view, transformative of how the IPT approached this issue. There's one other thing I wanted to say, which was about finding a case. David mentioned it, and I just wanted to say, I'm sorry to be really quick, finding a case. I don't think that's a healthy approach to say we need a case like we had with the people who were the undercover police officers. And the reason I don't think that's a healthy approach is because you can wait years to find out if something is going wrong with the system. And you can't approach it on the basis that until somebody is able to come forward and say, wow, 20 years ago, I found out the person I was having an affair with turned out to be an undercover cop abusing the system. You have to work on the basis that we need to make sure this is concretely dealing with problems that could happen, so that we don't look for the case that has happened before we do that. Very quickly, and then we will I was making a pragmatic point, not a legal one. I mean, my understanding is that in the US, the, 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 the church committee got going when people worked out the CIA had been trying to break up Martin Luther King's marriage and spying on the women's liberation movement. People got cross about that. Similarly, in Canada, the McDonald Commission, you had the the managers, which I think at the time were the intelligence agency, were apparently getting hold of the membership list of the separatist Parti Quebecois, not something, of course, you would ever imagine happening in modern-day British politics. So, in a way, you needed something like that too. <laughs> and yet, the only the only example that um, the NGOs put forward is the whole of Snowden wasn't this dreadful. You know, the best one they always produce is optic nerve. Now, it seems to have been a ludicrous project. The idea you could you could spy on on webcams and you get people. Uh, using webcams in their bedrooms, and there was undesirable nudity involved, and everyone had a good laugh, which was easier to do. But in, in a way, if you're going to capture the public imagination beyond the Guardian readers, in this country, <laughs> you, know, you need something better than that. Something more like the undercover police guns. Um, um, okay, well, we're, so going, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to take some questions from the floor now. Um, let's take um, the Baroness, and then you, and then you, if you could all identify yourselves, and then Keep your questions as brief as possible so that we can get through as many as we can. That'd be fantastic. Thanks very much for your fascinating panel. It's Sarah Lopez um, in the house, Lopez on the Lib Dem Europe spokesman. So I, I, I'm really just a sort of dilly canty trying to vaguely understand this, this area and hope, hopefully uh, help um, a little bit uh, uh, when Bill comes to the to the Lords. But um, what I wanted to ask was two things. First of all, do you think there's enough technical expertise? The point was made about technical expertise for the ICT. Is there enough technical expertise uh, within Parliament or available as advisors to Parliament, apart from things like David Donet, uh, uh, Ford, and so on? But um, it, it is that real technical understanding there. Um, and secondly, apart from things you've mentioned that are not uh, in the, the bill, and, and including Part 3, Ripper, I think, and so on, are there still secrets that, um, where, where the trust that we would hope to have that this bill, you know, is comprehensively part of the safety of intervention? Is that is that the case? Or are there still things that are are unknown unknowns? Okay. We don't know. And then, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, no, no. I have a question to David. The uh, the, the GCHQ's operational case and your Annex 9, I think they are an important part of a rational discourse. Uh, if we are going to say that bulk surveillance or mass surveillance has utility, then that discussion is not very needed and it could shift the proportionality so that some surveillance would, have become, would become acceptable, which wasn't previous. But there are still many parameters that are open there because there's the argument that too much A creates too much noise and resources are wasted and the same results could have been obtained by different methods, easier or cheaper or quicker. But that's not my main question. My main question is... Could we keep the questions brief, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say about the essence of the right argument, essence of privacy? Because then you don't have the proportion. And, and we are stuck with the old story, it's only metadata. When we now say, now it's content, and if we have bulk access, it, it's necessarily content, and it's content related to totally innocent people by definition. And that's why the new word says essence. And that you can explain away by saying proportion, because only 
operational case doesn't answer that at all. Okay, and there was a third question as well. Um, you were allowed to see the of Oxford. I just wanted to follow up on this concept of the essence of the rights. And the example that we are talking about, and I understand it's a pragmatic argument about what factors of public imagination beyond the Guardian. But I do think that, that, that our conception of privacy is really under, under theorized. The, the notion that, that we can only go to, for example, with people having babies or having bodies or having webcams in, inside homes is, is, a, is not where. The deep violation sits in the collective small chilling effects so surveillance and things that there doesn't seem to be a kind of evocative language of the problem in this country. So that CCTV is highly tolerated. And I think that there's an interesting kind of immunity to this, this notion of this constant, this constant observance. So I think that, that is partly why we keep re having recourse to these dramatic examples, which is way beyond what I would see as a right. Can I go very quickly on this? Uh, first of all, Sarah, technical expertise. You gave me a chance to come back to Matthew. I took evidence from Matthew. I, I give anything Matthew says the highest possible respect. And so I, I insisted on his behalf with the judges of the IPT, why don't you sit with technical assessors? Why didn't you get technical people on the court? I got a lot of pushback from them on the basis that they didn't want to get lumbered with some technical person who had a particular view. They prefer the traditional common law method of uh, experts on both sides and them having the ability to choose between them. That they may have been right, may have been wrong, that was their view. Parliament, I think the provision is there for the Intelligence and Security Committee to have excellent technical support. Thanks to the Justice and Security Act 2013, the changes after that, and a lot more people now on their staff. I suspect there have been practical difficulties in finding these people. And in fact, that's what everybody finds who is in this area. The really skilled technical people, they're either working for GCHQ or they're working at Silicon Valley, and they're certainly not sitting in some tedious committee or commission in London advising lawyers who don't really understand what they're on about. So uh, I think that is a problem, and I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the answer is. Uh, you asked about, are there still secrets? And I think this is an absolutely key uh, question. Um, the fact that I believe they were frank with me, for a start, isn't gonna uh, convince someone who's cynical about the whole thing. But more to the point, they didn't tell me what was in their minds for next year or the next five years, and things move on very quickly. Um, I agree with Matthew. I think we are indebted to Snowden for this whole debate. I don't condemn what he did, uh, but we are here because of Snowden. There's absolutely no doubt about that. However, I do not think that an endless succession of Snowdens is the right model by which to operate. And my intention in proposing this really powerful commission, which Matthew is good enough to say, you know, in most respects, seems to be what they want to do, is to ensure that that is powerful enough to drag stuff out of them. I mean, I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister. Yeah, I want this strong judge to be one level off the Supreme Court and the top judges in the country to be in the same position. He, he is guaranteed access to their systems. If his technical people find things that weren't being about it, I, I think they should be held to pay. Mm. Uh, and, and if that doesn't happen, then there will be more Snowdens and there will be more sympathy for Snowden, and that will not be good for any of us. Yes, it's a privacy. Yeah, sorry. Um, Martin, I'm first of all, you say, well, are they all wasting their time? spending this money. I, I've reviewed government agencies for five years. I've seen them waste their time. I know what it's like when they have budgets that, that are there for no reason. And I must admit, you know, I, I know about Bill Binney. I also know people who give evidence to the Oscar play. I don't think they're wasting their time. Um, but I don't expect to take that from you. Essence of the right. I find it difficult to be polite about this. It seems to me that in any rational world, there is a balance to be struck between the intrusion on someone's brain. OK, maybe a machine does collect the content of that. Is that so dreadful that no reason for doing it could possibly be powerful enough, not even by Annex 9 reasons, uh, some of which are operations, without which there will be people dead now uh, that are currently alive? I find it an extraordinary thing, uh, a sort of de en bas for the judges to say, well, we have decided that privacy rights are so important that nothing else could weigh against it in the balance. I hope, I don't have to read trends, we'll be discussing that tomorrow morning. Uh, let's see what comes out of that. Um, but if anything, we're going to make me an outer, and I think it would take a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, it would be the, the essence of the, the, the privacy right. Laura, I understand your point. I mean, the, the way I wrote a chapter on privacy, which I hope you enjoyed, chapter two. The, most, the best way I had of persuading myself of how serious privacy infringements were was to compare them, as, as, as a recent author has done, with environmental damage. Uh, one extra oil spill might not register very much, but when you look up in 20 years' time and you look around and the landscape is devastated, you think, my God, it's all happened bit by bit, and I wasn't noticed. So I, I do understand that. CCTV, I sat for eight years part-time as a criminal judge. 
Um, most of the cases I was doing, I wasn't on the fast track to, uh, to the sort of cases Matthew does, so I was doing town centre assaults and robberies and that sort of thing. Um, practically every one was CCTV evidence. I once had a jury actually write me a note saying, why is there no CCTV evidence in this case? They were very suspicious that there hadn't been any. That evidence was very useful in convicting criminals. I know that when people from other countries come here, they're surprised by how many cameras there are. 95% of them incidentally in private hands, rather than operated by public authorities. Um, for me, it's a price worth paying, but I also have another view. I'd be interested in hearing my So um, I think the right of the essence, I mean, I think the, the fact is that Having dealt with the US intelligence community over many years and looking at the British intelligence community, the way you are as a people dictates the way you respond to this type of legislation. So if you're in the US, it's about you as an American and the federal government affecting your rights as an American. Does the US individual care about what happens in Pakistan or Venezuela and the British rights of those people? No, because that's not the structure in which they're operating. My experience would be in Britain that actually people consider these matters largely ephemeral and largely unimportant. When Snowden was when Snowden first came out, a survey was done of British people about did the U, did the UK and um, security intelligence agencies have enough um, uh, have enough powers? That survey was very instructive because it basically sixty percent said yes they've got more than enough powers. Or so they've got enough powers. Twenty percent said they needed more, and then twenty percent needed less. And this is at the height of the Snowden revelations. So, so it, it's of, a, of great interest to the academics, um, uh, and to the academics and the privacy campaigners, but it is not something which captures the public imagination. And because it is about technical issues, um, uh, again, it, see, it, loses, um, uh, it loses the excitement. To go back to David's example, um, the jury who said, where's the CCTV? That tells you everything you need to know about um, the British approach to surveillance. The language is also important. Uh, go back to point basic. You know, the word was bulk surveillance. It's not bulk surveillance. It's about collection in bulk, which is an entirely different. Uh, it's an entirely different um, uh, concept. The science is involved. You're collecting in bulk, and the reason you're collecting in bulk is because the alternative, which is I would suggest, um, uh, what you see perhaps in the European Court judgment, it seems to me proceeds on the assumption that you know the answer. You know what you're looking for before you look for it. And you know where to find it. And you know you're going to get it. In some cases, that is absolutely true. You do know all of that. In many cases, you do not. And it's about discovering things that you don't know, which is why you end up with a situation which you have to collect more. And yes, at a notional level, the privacy of individuals who are entirely innocent is increased at a notional level. Fact is, are there sufficiently good, sufficiently clear, sufficiently regulated processes to ensure that only that which is needed um, uh, to be examined uh, to meet the national security ends you're looking at, um, are those processes in place? And that's the crucial question, which is why I think the bill, in general terms, and I think there are really good big debates to be had about bulk um, equipment interference about encryption, they are absolutely profitable about to have, which is why I think actually the bill, in largely in philosophical terms, replicating what we have today, works. So I believe that Matthew, you have to... Yeah. You have to... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but if, you, if you're willing, we could take one more round of questions. Yeah, I, I, can, I can give you. I can give you one. Okay. Yeah, as a final goodbye. Yes. <laughs> um, I think uh, what, what, what Michael just said, um, I think, does illustrate very clearly the, the way the debate uh, has happened and, and, and the way it needs to be more careful, and more rigorous. Because um, there is one point I would leave you with is that we are in this debate have moved pretty quickly. From a situation where we are looking at surveillance as something to find out uh, evidence of what we believe is happening, to finding out what is happening. And the, the reality of that is that putting every collecting in bulk to put every single person's communication through a filter after which you then decide what you're going to look at is not perceived by some as surveillance. It's perceived by others as surveillance. In other words, you're looking at everybody's communication to determine which are the ones you want to look at. And that's 
the, last, the, the my point really is that's a fundamental change in how English law views uh, the right of the state to interfere with your private possessions. Previously, general warrants and the idea that the king can knock down everybody's door to find out what they might have is something that we, as a nation, have turned our face against. The idea that we now, and it might be that it's justified in the current world, people might see the threats as sufficient, but the idea that now we need to give our security services the power to get everybody's communication just to check on who are the dangerous people out there so that we can know what's going on, because we don't, as Michael indicated, we don't yet know what's happening. Let's find out who's dangerous. That, for me, is one of the most dangerous things. Thank you. I'm sorry. Even though we can walk out the room, I'm going to answer as you walk out. We go back to the language. Every single person's data. Now, certainly, I would suggest that actually it's not every single person's data. And if I were you, though, what I would do is buy shares in a company which is in a, in a uh, technologically astute enough to um, turn the communications data into, into ICRs. Find that company, go and buy the shares tomorrow. Because again, I mean, for me, one of the issues is about the ICRs. This new power which David talked about. And in reality, I am not sure that the debate which seems to be drawing to a close at that point ought to be drawing to a close because that's where you get Matthew's point about every single person's data. Otherwise, I don't consider the bulk collection to be about every single person's data, and I don't think that's what David found when he looked at it. Okay, so let's have one more round of very brief questions, please. Um, we'll hear from you. Hi, uh, John here from Swamsey Powell Law School. Uh, so, in thinking about just uh, a further refinement of the last question, um, if you're collecting it to find out, I mean, to what extent does it turn and, and, and on whether you are collecting it to find out if you're able to predict, right, or to be able to, in a sense, solve the past crime? Because my understanding is the bulk collection tends to be much more effective for the latter, that is, to sort of have to find out what happened, you know, after to go back after you, you were talking about CCTV and criminal cases to actually build a case after it happened. But a lot of the rationale for the bulk collection is for more preventive purposes and uh, just a question how actually useful uh, that kind of surveillance is for that specific purpose. Okay. Yeah. I <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. I wanted to go back to the question of oversight. Uh, and one comment that Michael wondered about why it is that people are so preoccupied with lawyers and journalists when there are millions and millions of people who aren't lawyers and journalists. And I think on one level, he's certainly right that this is a question of, of the privacy of all people. But in a society where a government holds a great deal of power, the principal sources of countervailing power that we have are lawyers and journalists. And if you're going to constrain their ability, then you really shut down on countervailing power. So what I wanted to ask is, talk about systems of, of oversight, um, it's not clear how much of the oversight is ex post. You seem, it seems like you've described programmatic review by the commissioners cell, and I think what we wonder about is to what extent on every individual warrant or any individual warrant does someone decide after the fact when you can have an adversarial hearing, not just that the program is working well in general, but was the warrant to uh, surveil David Anderson, was that justified by probable cause? Okay, and? I made for a comment and uh, a contribution of uh, been indeed doing, um, where my name is about from justice, doing our briefing for Poland. Just anybody who wants to participate, does it mean that you're Tuesday? It's the 15th, not the 19th. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, so that actually, uh, I'm looking forward to a very long evening of finishing our briefing. I'm <laughs> <laughs> very excited when the 19th came up and went on to put on the website. So if anybody is going to participate in the conversation, and I hope you all do, please know that it's on Tuesday. That's all. Okay, so. Okay, well, I, I, I feel that this, this sort of scoop person should be answering that question <laughs> <laughs> about what the stuff is useful for. Um, but all I can tell you is what I, what I heard and what I found. But, um, I think you know more than I do, David. I've not been there before. I've been there today. But I think I think there is an element of both. And I'm just tempted to say, on the on the heavy GCHQ uh, predict side of it, look at Annex Nine to my report. Um, I only wish they'd allowed me to put names by some of those instances, because you'd have heard of quite a few of them. Um, and uh, just to give one example, um, they understood this is in the days when Al Qaeda plots are directed from Afpak, 
um, that the, uh, the way by which the various uh, Al Qaeda envoys in different parts of Europe were to communicate each, with each other was by a, a specific way of using devices, which was very unusual. And it was by able, it was by trawling through the vast objects of conversation that they identify the people that had heard that conversation and head off a plot that I think was due to happen in another European country. Well, that was just, I should say certainly the comms data is much more useful than the content, particularly in the UK, where we don't have the money they have in the NSA. So we can't afford to read all the stuff that you read. Um, and so perhaps a little clever and historical <laughs> conversation <laughs> that would be true. Um, but and then on the on the detection side, it's difficult to I mean, look, look at all the stuff in another annex about the data retention directive. A lot of that I've got from Germany, incidentally. The German police and internal security service are just desperate that they are not getting this retained yeah. data. Now, you might say, who am I to listen to them? But of course I listen to the Department of Justice, and I, I respect the privacy groups and telecom suppliers and everyone else as well. They produce a great dossier for the police, the German interior ministry, say, these are all the pedophiles we've missed. These are the other serious criminals we've missed. And it, it's, it's partly it's target identification. Very often it's when you've got your target. Uh, and uh, you don't know what they were doing or what they were speaking to. You might have got the little guy that was carrying the drugs, but you don't know who Mr. Big was. And Mr. Big, being a careful fellow, has made sure he hasn't communicated with the mule for three months or so. So if you go back six months, that's when you might find communication. That's when you might be able to piece the conspiracy together. So I think it's very varied. That's what they always tell you. And, and you can't say that it's all about prediction or it's all about invention. Can I just add to that as well? I think I mean, that's absolutely right. But I think it's, it's wrong. And there's a popular image that you know, people sit there they don't know the starting point. The fact is there is always a starting point. And it's about, it's not just trawling indiscriminately, looking for a starting point. It's knowing that, okay, so we know historically, and well, this hasn't frankly changed since this Cold War, where you know, everybody now knows that the Western powers couldn't read um, uh, Soviet communications. So what you did was you looked at the way people communicated with each other and you worked out from that how or what, what the threats were. It's exactly the same today in terrorism or, or serious crime. It is a means of, you've got a starting point, you've got an inkling, something's happened there, some, uh, the informant's told you this, the informant's told you, I've seen someone using um, a blow fight in a particular way. And then you look. So it's, it's an iterative process. And the suggestion, and again, goes back to the kind of the popular conception, which is, you know, like, is it an enemy of the state where they sit there and they can do all the stuff they do, well, that's a wonderful, you know, conceit, interestingly, direct against US citizens, when I put that point aside, um, uh, um, um, where it's not, it's not really like that. It's a question of having some information, using it, building on it, using a smart form of, um, uh, a smart form of technical and intellectual um, uh, exercise to get where you want. And if Snowden teaches us nothing, it is that the British government, contrary to popular belief, is pretty good at doing IT. And on oversight after the fact. <laughs> on oversight after the fact, I mean, again, I think the fact is that um, uh, you, there's a mixed economy. Um, we're moving closer to um, uh, oversight before the fact. Um, you could have the debate Matthew's been talking about, about authorization against approval. Um, uh, there is a philosophical um, argument at the centre of that, which says politicians are responsible for national security. We're the ones who carry the can when there's um, uh, when there's an atrocity, not the judges. It's up to us to determine that. And I have some sympathy for that as a philosophical approach. Um, and if you accept that philosophy, and if you accept um, uh, if, you, if you accept there is a need for a judicial element, then you need to balance it. Whether the balance is quite in the right place or not in the right place. Um, I leave you to, um, uh, to judge, and you need to judge yourself. What I would say is this, having over many years prepared warrants, been examined, I can think by more than one foreign secretary who's given me a hard time, um, uh, and also having prepared unusually warrants um, uh, in law enforcement, where I worked um, before I went to GCHQ, and uh, having um, uh, then contested government um, uh, warrants, which I do all the time now, my experience tells me that um, um, uh, warrants approved by politicians probably get rather better scrutiny than warrants approved by judges. Well, we've never seen a warrant approved by a judge in this country, so we wouldn't. Well, um, <laughs> but, 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 but for searches, but for searches, for searches and that sort of thing. That applies to politicians uh, issuing two and a half thousand warrants a year, does it? As well as running criminal justice policy, immigration policy, and kind of um, because, and, the and the difference is this, though, David. The difference is that if you go before a magistrate or a judge, he, he is doing it himself. He doesn't really have a clue. He doesn't have much time, or she, he or she doesn't have much time. They don't really understand what's involved. 
what the, what the politician has, and David um, uh, admits to say, is a very competent staff who are in a position to pre-check. It's like the judge, it's like when we presented the judge saying, I have a degree of assurance that this meets minimum standards before. Now you may not like that, but that's, there is much more scrutiny given as a part of the process to an interception warrant than there will be for so The court. crucial difference with ex post is that it can be adversarial. Any ex ante authorization or approval, whatever have you, it must necessarily be ex parte and one sided. It's only after the fact that you can bring lawyers in from both sides to challenge it. That was the yeah. thrust of my question. Yeah, sorry, I looked at you when I was answering his question, so I should look at you <laughs> when I answer yours. But, uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> No, no, I mean, the, the, the scheme of this commission, people say, well, it's the judge marking his own homework. What happens is the judge signs the warrant. It's then approved. The commission is also, it will maintain the current responsibility of the interception uh, communications commission to do the after-sales service. Now, they don't look at every warrant at the moment. I think they look at about 25%, and they look at an even smaller proportion of the, the compensation applications. But the idea is the judge will be able to direct the technical inspectors, who are often you know, ex-police, ex-custom people get inside the system, I'm particularly concerned about this one when you look at it straight away. Or else the inspectors, if they find something, you know, it doesn't seem to be doing what we intended, they can recommend it back to the judge and you can get the vote. But I very much, I will take away, if I may, not what's anything to do with me anymore, this idea that perhaps it's after the event that you have real scope for the adversarial proceeding. I don't think there's anything in the bill or code of practice that would pre prevent that. I'd rather envisage them using the lawyers as an amicus at the beginning, but I, I do see the value. And I can okay. certainly see from a public, um, uh, a public yeah, just two seconds, a public, <laughs> um, a public um, accountability exercise of the role of an amicus in issuing the warrant being a crucial and important improvement. I absolutely buy that. Such a crucial and important improvement to the IP bill. Um, thank you so much to my panelists and um, to all of to all of your questions. I encourage you to mob them you can the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your time and for you joining me and thank you for having us. If I could just have your attention for one second. So we have a drink here now and then we've got dinner in the river facing wing in Tom's kitchen so we can walk over there. Dinner's booked for eight, which is in about 40 minutes time. I know that the morning of the second day is generally treated as the graveyard slot, but mention was made of friends against Technically, I think the Irish State Protection Commissioner, but Max Schrems puts it as Europe against Facebook. And he is Skyping into our first session tomorrow morning at half nine, and we only have him for about 10 or 15 minutes at the start of the session because he's fitting us in as a last minute request for me. And so come, basically, is what I'm saying. Be on time tomorrow morning, ask Max Schrems what you want to know. We then have a paper from uh, Maria on the case and a comment from Theodore Christou, Christou of Queen Mary about it. And then for the second half of that surveillance session, uh, we're going to talk about Apple, Apple against the FBI. This is cropped up because of, as an opportunity because unfortunately Clive Walker, who was meant to present the paper, was in a car accident, but he is fine, don't worry. We will still have someone who's an encyclopedic knowledge of British Cambridge Heritage Law. David will still be able to rely on him as a special advisor, but unfortunately he isn't going to be here tomorrow. So we've um, turned that time over to Apple against the FBI. Now Stephen Schulhofer is very kind to agree to jump on the grenade of issue spotting for us on basically two days notice. And when I mean, when I say kindly agree to jump the grenade, I pulled that pin out of the grenade, I tossed it at Stephen, then I rugby tackled him to the ground and it went off. So please come along and help Stephen out and help the rest of us out unpick what Apple against the FBI means in the US and how it might look here in the UK. And um, it's not fair to leave it all on him. So let's have a drink, I think we've all learned it. Thank you very much. Thank you so 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 much. Th